I'm a huge fan of the idea of combo lights, lights that would do flood and throw, but in practice, they usually fall short. But if there's a really good implementation of flood and throw, I'm listening. Welcome back to Shoe Lights. You know, that flood and throw thing, that is the holy grail of flashlights, to have both style of lights in one unit so you don't have to carry multiple lights. But I find that when you put two lights together, usually they're just bulky, or the flood isn't really floody enough, the throw isn't throwy enough. It's like there's always compromises. Just to give you an example of how much I love flood and throw, I'm gonna show you this LM Toolworks custom that I have. This is an insanely expensive light, but the fact of the matter is it's got this really crazy idea where there's mule emitters all around the edge and then a concentrated reflector in the middle so you can get really nice flood and then you can get that throw you need. So I love things like this. Well, not everyone's got money to spend on an LM Toolworks. This thing was like $700. So that's where I think that Olight is a great company. Olight is always coming out with really neat things like this prowess. Let me get a good shot on this. This prowess is a flood and throw production light and it's got so much going for it. It's got an amazing shape. I just love the way it feels in hand, the way it looks. It's got a really holdable host here with a head that kind of protrudes that gives you a bunch of power in the front. And it's a re got a really cool secret on the back, which is if you flip it over, it's got this filament all the way around. So if you take a look at it, you got the emitters in the front, then you turn it around and flick it, and you got this filament in the back here that can brighten. But like Olight is usually accused of, they go for max lumens not tint and not color. So for example, if I show you right here, even on my video here, my video uh, I've just did here in the studio, you can see how green that is on my hand. Let's take a look at the Sekonic and see what our reading would be. This is on low, of course, but look at that. We got 5300K, which isn't much of an issue. That's around daylight, but look at the Delta UV. It's 141 points above, and then of course, it's a low CRI admitter. Now, the ring around the side here is actually a pleasant 3000K, kind of mimicking incandescent light. It's also low CRI, but the tint, bang on, zero all of the way across. So really, what I wanna do is I just wanna bust in this light, change out the emitters, and I'll have a perfect light. So uh, yeah, this is kind of a combo review of this light, just a light review, I mean a lightweight review, and then I'm gonna show what I would do to make it a perfect light. So I mean, if you don't have the money for something like this, uh, and who does, then you know, for saving a few bucks, you can get something like this and then just make it your own. Let's just take a quick look at the UI. I don't wanna get to modding before I take a look at that but notice that it's got a button here. It looks like a rotary button. It's not, it's just a press button, but it's a click and hold. Okay, you got you know, four modes there. And then double click to turbo, double click returns you back. But this toggle right here is really great because then when this is on on the front here, there we go, just toggle it back and that indicates the back LED light source. This is a ramping LED on the back there. Isn't that cool? It ramps higher, and then when it gets to the highest, it double flashes to indicate it's at the highest. And if you double tap from high, it goes straight to low, and if you double tap from low, it goes straight to high. So it's a very simple to use interface, which I love simplicity. I mean, who wants to memorize a bunch of complex flashlight interfaces? But let's head out to my workshop, let's swap these LEDs, see what we come up with. You know, I almost went out to the workshop and I realized yeah, I don't care how many lumens it's gonna lose by putting high CRA good tint emitters in uh, over the, I'm assuming, Osram P9s that are in here, which are max lumens and not great tint. But I'm sure somebody in the audience wants to know, so let's take a look on the lumen tube, or actually integrating sphere here. And uh, this isn't gonna be super scientific, but you see it hit about 
4,400 up there. I just want to point out where we're starting. Now, the reason why it's not super scientific is I had a light gap. You could see when I just did it, and this isn't a fully charged battery, but I'm not going to use it anymore. I'm going to go swap it. We're going to measure the tint and get the lumens when we're done. All right, welcome to the madness of my shop. Don't judge me. I wanted to show that the first thing you got to do when you want to swap this light is you got to use strap wrenches. I like these Craftsman strap wrenches. They came in a pack of a thick one and a thin one, but I bought two packs. I get the thin ones only. So what I do is I put one strap wrench uh, around the head, kind of around the black part, and then another one the other way, just at the blue bezel, and I crank it. Now, I've done that off camera for sake of time, but you can see that now that I've done that, this thing moves freely. This isn't gonna be a full emitter swap video because I have a lot of those. And you can see that I just used tape to get this optic out. So I'm not gonna go through every step, but once I pop this white kind of uh, centering gasket out, I'm gonna unsolder the MCPCB and then I'm gonna put it on my hot plate here and I'm going to swap in these brand new hotness Fireflies 351A 4000K Rose Edition. Oh, I can't wait. I'm gonna put a bunch of them in there and see how they do. This, I, I'm really hopeful because I loved Fireflies. They're 3500, 3700, they kind of switched names around, but I got the early batch that were rosy, and these are supposed to be just perfect tint, nice and rosy, high CRIs. They have the Foster all the way across the surface, and as you can see, they're domeless. So they have very minimal tint shift and very throwy. Okay, so I got all the gaskets and optics out and everything, and I'm about to uh, remove the screws and unsolder this MCPCB and swap them. But I did want to point out that there's lots of little tiny extra, like, O-rings and stuff around all this. So just make sure when you're popping it apart, you really pay attention to the order. I also want to remind you this is not a complete walkthrough. If you need one, uh, check out the link right here for an entire walkthrough of the process where I talk about the tools and the techniques. But uh, let's jump into swapping this. You know, I just unsoldered all these leads and you know, Olight makes really great quality lights. These are some of the better wires that I've seen in any production light from the standpoint that to get this solder melted, you gotta go pretty high, about 380 or so and I'm holding the jacket here and pulling until it loosens and the jacket withstood it. There's a lot of strands in here for high current. I mean, they make good stuff. I'm not, I, I know it might sound like I'm, you know, really uh, a fanboy, but just because I think their stuff's high quality. Now, once these screws are out, um, here's a little tip. Uh, this little guy, it's a nail that I just bent the very tip of. And what I like to do is I like to get in one of these holes, get underneath the MCPCB and pull up like that. That's how I do it. Okay, so now the MCPCB is out. Oh, that's gonna, that's gonna present an issue. I'm gonna have to remove these to put this on the uh, hot plate and reflow. Well, one more step, but I'll do it. Okay, so I got this one out on the other side over here. Um, it's just a, like a pogo pin that connects the top MCPCB to the bottom one. Um, I guess for, I don't know, grounding or something? I'm not really sure. But anyhow, um, I found the way that I like to remove it. I tried a couple techniques. Uh, I tried hot air and it was tragic as usual. But I just uh, put a bunch of uh, flux on there like that. Set a really wide tip like this to about 400 degrees. Grab the pogo pin on the bottom and then uh, heat it up. Uh, there we go. Just really get a lot of contact. There we go. Starting to melt. And once it gets all melty, then I'll just push up from below. And there we go, push up. And then just kind of hold it for a second. And the solder solidifies. And then you can just, well, you can see that it's already loose. You can see I could just weasel it out like this. But what I'm actually gonna do is just hit with a little more heat. There we go. All right, so I've cleaned up the board and I have uh, gone ahead and put a little uh, chip flux there, SMD flux, and I'm just setting these guys on there in the correct polarity. Again, I wanna point out that all these little tips about how you know the polarity, you can see negatives on actually this side. Wait, where's my finger? 
right there. And he gives on this side, and the other side's positive. So um, all these little tips are covered in that other modding video I was talking about and linked to. So if you want to know more, just go ahead and look there. But uh, next shot will be these melting into place, which is my favorite shot. All right, set that down there carefully. And then we'll watch those things melt and center by themselves. Oh, I love that. I love that so much. See that top one just bounce in? All right, let's test that reflow. Ah, oh, perfect. Once you got the pins soldered back in, don't forget to put these little isolating grommets over the pins and slather some uh, thermal paste all over the board before you reinstall it. While I still had the uh, glass and the optic off, I wanted to show the new emitters. Gosh, they're gorgeous. I finished swapping it and the beam is more concentrated. That means more candela because they're domeless. Great beam, you can see it's not all funky. There's no artifacts, looks, looks good. All right, I'm back from swapping it and initially, oh wow, looks so much better. Even on this camera, you can just tell in my hand it's not green. But let's see the bad news first. So there's going to be a lumen loss, of course, because it's high CRI and warmer. So let's go to the lumen tube and same battery and double tap. So 2,400. So we went from 30, no, sorry, 40, 4,400 to 2,400. So if you just, I'm rounding, but if you go from 5,000 to 3,000, uh, you know, that's 60% uh, of the output. So, you know, when you do things like this, you're gonna lose output, and that actually explains why Olight uses the emitters they do. But I've never been a guy that cared about, you know, having 5,000 lumens. What I cared about was that right there. Let's get a shot of that. So just under 4,000K, negative 100 on the Delta UV, RA of 92, and then R9 of 70. Um, you know, high CRI is anything over 90 for the RA, anything over 50 for the R9. So that's just gorgeous. And, and also, let's not overemphasize how much CRI matters. It really is more complicated than that. There's the beam shape, there's the tint, and the CCT. And I would argue that tint and CCT are far more important than CRI, but this thing has all of it. So you give up a little lumens, but I mean, I, I just can't deal with that grain. So this is now a light that I'll carry with pride. And uh, for about 120 bucks or whatever it was, uh, what a steal. So hopefully that was a good little mini review of the new Olight Prowess. It's been out for a bit. I didn't hit launch date or anything. I kind of sat on it. But you know, these days, I really want to focus on reviewing less items and items that matter more to me. And um, you know, I've been accused of being an Olight shill. No, nah, they make really good lights. Everything about this light is stellar from the shape, the design, the ergonomics, the build quality. They're just accused of two things and two things only, and that is uh, using high lumen, not great tinted emitters, and then proprietary batteries. But, you know, the proprietary batteries is something that doesn't really matter to me because it comes with the cell. And man, I go through light so fast. Uh, this light will be either lost, stolen, or broken before the battery wears out. So um, I've never really taken that view of, let's have a light for 20 years and I gotta have, you know, off the shelf parts to replace it. I mean, there's gonna be something that replaces this like in six months. So th that never mattered to me. Um, so, I do understand Olight's stance of trying to hit max lumens because the wider market, the non-enthusiast market, but the wider just, you know, flashlight buying public, read those lumens and it matters to them. You know, they see 4,400 or 5,000, because that's probably what it is if I had no light leaks, dropping down to 3,000 and they're going to go, what? But, I mean, people like me just don't care. We care about the tint and the quality. And you know what? If I was a better reviewer, I would have actually measured the 
candela before and after because I have a sneaking suspicion that with the domeless smaller die emitters that the Fireflies 351As are versus the Osram P9 that it was, you know, installed with, I bet that the beam is so considerably more concentrated, it was very floody to start with, that the candela probably makes up for the lumen loss anyways. And what I mean by that is if I shine this on an object, you know, 100 feet away, I bet you that object is just as bright with the new lower lumen emitters than it was with the old emitters because it was spreading the light out. All right, I was editing the video and I thought, dang, I need a Kendall measurement. I can't just make a supposition. I gotta have proof. So I went on the website and looked up what the spec for the throw for this light stock was, and it was 245 meters. Then I did my own Kendall measurement on the now Fireflies emitters in it, 282. So indeed, objects will be brighter in these emitters with better tint and CRI, just less flood. All right, guys, hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you in the next review.